بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله الذي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علومك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحم الحمد لله we are able to resume our studies in the Hose and as you remember we finished unit 3 of Islamic belief system so now we are going to start with unit 4 which is about prophethood this unit starts with an introduction about the aims of the unit and as you will see or you have already seen uh, the idea is to explain that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has created us with lots of potentials as we discuss in anthropology he has also provided us with guidance so not only he is our creator but he's also our guide and inshallah we will explain this in more details so in this unit we will talk about general guidance and a specific guidance and then when we focus on revelation as one of the types of guidance that Allah has given humanity then we talk about religions prophets divine scriptures in the next unit we focus on the prophet of Islam and the revelation of the Quran and then we will talk about the resurrection in unit 6 and finally in unit 7 we'll talk inshallah about salvation or felicity so if we follow the plan of God and the guidance that God has provided us to understand his plan then we would have happiness in this world and the hereafter for us as individuals and as humanity so this is the remaining structure of the book so here the idea is to talk about guidance in general and then prophethood we have an example in the beginning of this unit about a difference between an ant and an elephant no ant becomes an elephant or elephant becomes an ant it means that in their creation there is a guidance in the form of genes in the form of instincts that the way they reproduce the way they are grown the way they grow the way they you know meet their needs everything is according to their own way of existence and their own way of uh, creation it's like you have different path every type of animal birds insects plants even non-living beings they follow their own path no one goes to the path of the other one and no one would remain stuck if there are no external barriers everyone inside its own creation has the means and the guidance to go towards its own destiny when Pharaoh asked Musa and Harun alayhim assalam wa man rabbukuma ya Musa who is your lord O Musa but he says Rabbukuma he uses Muthanna Jual because Harun was also there 
So he said, who is your Lord? He said, Rabbuna alladhi a'ata kulla shay'in khalqahu thumma hada. This is in chapter 20, verse 50, Surah Taha. Our Lord is the one who has given everything its due creation, but also he guided. So he gave everything its due creation and then he guided them. God has not just created and left things in this world without guidance, without planning, without arrangements. Or as you are all familiar with Surah A'la, Sabbi ism rabbika al-a'la al-ladhi khalaqa fa sawa wa al-ladhi qaddara fa hada Sabbi ism rabbika al-a'la al-ladhi khalaqa he created fa sawa he completed so when he created human beings he created animals plants he gave them whatever they needed in their creation this is the beginning point, the starting point, but also hada for the future, for their development. So, we have what we call in Chalam Al Hidayatul Am. This is a principle. Al Hidayatul Am means general guidance. Okay? But in addition to this general guidance, Human beings have extra guidance, additional, extra guidance. And this is what we call al-hidayatul khasa, a specific guidance. This is in addition. For example, there are many things that we understand through our fitra. You remember we talked about fitra when we developed uh, the argument from fitra in the Unit 2, one of the three arguments was fitra. And we had a detailed discussion about what is fitra, what are the characteristics of fitri things, what is the difference between fitra and gariza instinct. You remember we discussed all these things. So there are things that we understand through our fitra. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَنَفْسِ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْلَاهَا Allah has inspired us to understand what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong. We can understand that. There are many things we understand through our fitra. Do you remember we said fitra has two sides? One is understanding and one is desire and inclination. We have some understanding of God, which is fitri. We have yearning for God, which is a kind of inclination. So fitra comes in two forms. Then we talked about, you know, our fitri desire for knowledge, for beauty, for ihsan, for you know, goodness and all these things. So, there are things that we understand through our fitra. There are things that we understand through our aql, intellect. And these are very important, the things that we understand through intellect. Again, we talked about animals not being able to understand except very little for example if you remember we said they don't have any sense of future they don't you know reflect about future or predict or anticipate what's going to happen it's about the moment maybe even their memory is very short you know some animals have very low memory some have more but some have very short memory but for sure even if they have memory it's something about their own experience. It's not that they study the history of 200 years ago or 1,000 years ago. The maximum is in their memory from the beginning of their own experiences. Okay, They don't go to previous generations. They don't go to, uh, I don't know, discover historical you know, events in the past. And nothing about the future. Very much about the moment, the current thing. And also, if you remember, we said it's about the particular thing, not universal things. For example, we said, you know, cats, 
don't develop a science about you know mouse mouseology you remember we had these discussions anyway there are many things that we understand through our apple our intellect and this is a way to understand right and wrong but also how to achieve right and sometimes it's not right and wrong or good and bad it's also a matter of comparison for example you understand what is better if there are two options which are good or if there are three what one which one is the best or sometimes you have two bad options but which one is worse so it's not always between good and bad sometimes it's between good and better sometimes it's between bad and worse so there are different options but the third thing which we are going to discuss more is what revelation al -wahy. we are talking about wahy and this is very important we muslims also christians jews we all believe in the need for revelation for prophets of course in christianity there is a difference between christianity on the one side and islam and judaism on the other side uh, in christianity they believe that there are two stages in God's relation with humanity or two types of covenants two types of you know testament there was an era that God used to send the prophets and reveal to the prophets and that is what they call Old Testament so they share with us all the prophets before Jesus but then they say in the case of Jesus God didn't send a prophet to whom he revealed God revealed himself by sending his son okay so from this point there is a difference between Christians on the one side and Muslims and Jews on the other side but we both whether Muslim and Christian the uh, Jews or Christians both parties believe that we need guidance from God more than reason okay whether it be by sending revelation to a prophet or by revealing himself in his son it doesn't make difference with respect to the fact that we need something more than our own intellect and more than our own you know instincts we need extra guidance from God this is why we for example refer to the Quran they refer to the Bible Jews refer to the um, Old Testament which is part of the Bible for the Christians because we all believe that we need extra guidance from God so what is the relation between reason and revelation or intellect and revelation this is a very important question any book on philosophy of religion that you pick up you would find a chapter at least on this topic what is the relation between reason and revelation sometimes this takes uh, us to another question which is related very much to this and that is the relation between science and revelation or science and religion the idea is this there are things that we are able to understand by ourselves by using our intellect and our experiences of course this is all blessing of God there is no doubt about it but it's something that God has enabled us to understand and there are things that we are not able to understand by ourselves and God reveals to us through the prophets what is the relation between these two how much we can learn by ourselves how much we are going to learn through the revelation and are the things that we receive from both 
because some of the things we only receive from one source, for example, from intellect or from revelation. But there are things that they overlap. So if they overlap, and if there is conflict, what should we do? Our understanding is this. We say, whether it be intellect or revelation, they are both coming from the same God. Intellect is something that God has given us through creation, and revelation is something that God has given us through his legislation and tashri' and sending prophets and books. We can never think of any conflict between two messages, two communications coming from the same God. Can you think? Someone who is wise and knowledgeable would give you conflicting instructions, conflicting messages, conflicting teachings. It's impossible. If there is a conflict between what you understand from the revelation or from a scripture, which is the presentation of revelation, if there is a conflict between this and what you can understand by your intellect, you have to double check your understanding. Maybe you made a mistake in understanding the scripture. There are many people who misunderstand the scripture. Maybe you made a mistake in understanding what is the decisive judgment of intellect. You see, philosophers, although they rely on intellect, they very much disagree with each other. And means that they can make mistakes. We can make mistakes in understanding what is really a rational position about a specific issue. So, if there seems to be a conflict between revelation and reason or intellect, you have to double-check both sides. There must be a mistake at least in one side. Maybe in both sides you misunderstood, or at least in one side you misunderstood. We can never think of God telling us Two contradictory things. Imam Qadim alayhi salam very beautifully <coughs> said in his hadith to Hisham ibn Hakam, Inna lillahi ta'ala ala nas hujjatain. Truly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has two hujjah for people. Hujjatan wahirah wa hiya al-anbiya'u wal-rusul wal Allah has two types of hujjah, two types of proof or two types of communicating his will to us. One is external and that is the prophets and messengers and imams. The other is internal and that is intellect. So both are hujjah. Both are reliable. Both are things that you can Act upon them, and on the day of judgment, you can say to Allah, If I acted in this way, if I believed in this way, this is because of your hujjah. There is no conflict between them. Yes, maybe there are issues in which one side is silent. For example, there are many issues that are intellect is silent because it doesn't have the means doesn't have the data to make any judgment many things about for example the hereafter we don't understand by ourselves it's not that we understand it in a mistaken way no Agl doesn't have any judgment Agl is silent even in this world there are many things that you don't understand through your intellect you need to understand it through other means for example if someone asks you to describe 
a country that you have never visited or a place that you have never visited? Can you develop intellectual arguments to describe that country? No. You have to either go and see yourself or ask the people who have been there. Or if someone asks you to describe the taste of ice cream by intellect, you cannot. You cannot be expecting a philosopher, even if a great philosopher, to use philosophical arguments to say what is the taste of ice cream. Or what is the touch of, for example, a flower. This is something that you have to use your perception, your senses. So, reason has a realm, as a territory, in which it can function, and there are things which are beyond reason. Reason is silent there. So, Quran says very beautifully that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us through revelation, for example, in the case of Quran, Certain things that we were not able to understand by ourselves. The Quran, the Prophet, teach us what we were not able to know by ourselves. But also there are things that they teach us as a reminder. So there are new things for us to discover and there are things that we know or we could have known but we didn't notice or we forget and we need to be reminded. You know, Quran has different names. One of the names of Quran is Dhikr. In huwa illa dhikrun lil alam. It's a reminder. Amir al in Nahj al talking about the mission of the Prophet and which is, of course, a general thing about all the prophets, mentions few things. One is, يُثِيرُ لَهُمْ دَفَائِنَ الْعُقُولِ The prophets came to unearth the treasures of intellect, which are buried. You know, imagine you have treasures of Jewelries, someone needs to dig the earth and bring them out. We have also treasures of aql, lots of wise points, lots of good things that unfortunately they are buried. And Bia prophets come to help us to unearth and bring them out. It's a kind of reminder. Yudakeruhum mansiya ni'mate. Also, the prophets remind us of the blessings of Allah, the bounties of Allah that we have forgotten. The prophets keep reminding us how much Allah has been generous with us, how much Allah has been, you know, gracious and giving us. And also, yasta'aduhum fitratahi. Also, they came to ask us to be loyal. To the covenant and the treaty that we have made with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In any case, there is no conflict between reason and revelation. There is complete harmony. But there are things that we may not be able to understand by ourselves. And we get it only through revelation. There are things that we can understand from both sources. Also, there are maybe things that revelation is not talking about them. Because these are not necessary for our guidance. We can understand it. For example, how to make... A building, how to make a road, how to make a bridge, how to develop some, I don't know, medicines. These are things that you can use your reason and your, you know, empirical knowledge and make it. We don't expect religion to come and tell us how to cook. You know, yes, principles, values, we get from them. But the rest, you have to follow the conventional method of understanding. So, this is about rela relation between reason and revelation. Now, let us focus more on revelation. The term that we use in Arabic, the technical term is wahi. Okay? Wahi. 
This is a term which is used in the Quran and if you are interested, I have also a paper about uh, Revelation uh, published in several places. One is in uh, Islamic reference series. The second volume is Word of God. But first I prepared this paper for a conference in Poland organized by Pontifical Academy of Theology in Krakow. And also this was published in uh, Islamo Christiana by uh, the Catholics, you know, in Vatican. Then we published it in our own also uh, Islamic reference series. So in that paper, I have explained the meaning, literal meaning of why, the technical meaning of why, different usage of this term in the Quran, and some of the characteristics of why according to Islam and according to the Shia. Briefly, why literally means to give a message quickly and secretly. If I speak in the way that everyone understands, then this is not wahi. But if there is a message that I want to give to one of you, or some of you, not everyone, and I am able to communicate to that person or those people secretly and quickly, this is called wah. So in Arabic, you have three elements, giving a message secretly and quickly. It's a, a type of communication to a specific people. But in the Quran, you find that why has been used in different ways. This general meaning is almost there, but they have different categories. Sometimes the Quran uses the term wahi for the guidance that God has given to, for example, insects or maybe to other types of beings and animals. I'm sure you all have come across this verse about honeybees. Awha rabbuka illa nahl. Nahl is bee, yeah? Honeybee. Awha rabbuka illa nahl an takhidi min al jibal buyuta. God has communicated to the bees to adopt mountains as their homes. You know, one of the, or maybe the best, or one of the best types of honey is produced in mountains. Yeah? So, God has guided them, has made them understand this through their instincts. They know where to make their home, how to make their homes. And you know, scientists are surprised with the way they design and make their homes. There are lots of points about it. For this Communication, the Quran uses the term awha. So you understand that this wahi is not wahi like Quran. This wahi is not like, you know, Injil or Torah. This wahi means what? A kind of guidance through instincts. Something given to the bees, not to the other insects or, you know, other animals. Something specific, and something which is somehow secret. Sometimes the Quran uses wahi in the sense of inspiration for human beings. But human beings who may not be a prophet. Do you remember the case in the Quran that Allah talks about a person that God 
inspired him to do something and uses the term awha or awhaina yes mother of musa ala nabina wa salam received wah awhaina ila umm musa an ardi but we cannot say she was a prophetess no this is inspiration god put this idea in her mind and heart that she should foster Musa, put Musa in a gasket, and throw it into the river. Okay? The term which is used is awhaina ila umm Musa, which means we inspired her. The third type of way is what we study in aqa'id. What is I call prophetic revelation, and that is the message that God sends to His chosen servants who are responsible for guiding humanity. As you know, in the course of history, we have had 124,000 prophets, Nabi. The number is not mentioned in the Quran, but the number is mentioned in some hadith that God has sent 124,000 prophets. What we call the prophets in Arabic? Anbiya or Nabiyin. Yeah? Nabiyin or Anbiya, these are the prophets. Out of them, we have 313 messengers or rasul rasul or rusul the plural for rasul is rusul or mursalin these are the people that not only they have been receiving revelation they have been receiving a special message like a special sharia or a special book a special code of law because many prophets they preached the Sharia of a person who was either existing in their own time or before them. They were like preachers. It's not that 124,000 books were given or 124,000 you know, Sharia were given. There were only 313 Rasul. And out of these 313, Five of them are what we call ulul azm, those of great determination. Inshallah, we will talk about this later. So, these 124,000, and certainly those 313, because 313 are from these 124,000, they all received revelation. And this revelation was not for their own only benefit this revelation was to guide mankind so they were guides provided with immune knowledge and communication from god so that they would teach people and help people in their growth spiritual growth and development so the third type of wahi the third type of usage of wahi in the quran is prophetic revelation we talked about the relation between reason and revelation there is a reference in the book about revelation and science in the history of Christianity, you find that there was a big debate about reason, the, uh, sorry, relation between religion and science. Because towards the end of medieval ages and then after, you know, Renaissance, there were some 
issues discovered by scientists that didn't match the Bible because Bible mentions some of the details which science also has something to say about it and there were issues here some people denied what the science found some people denied the Bible some people then they developed the understanding that in these cases uh, maybe we have not to take these things literally from the Bible and we should get the spirit of it or these are the things that uh, have been said by those who have reported these Bible you know Gospels to us according to the framework of their time there are lots of issues discussions here for us Muslims we don't have anything in the Quran which contradicts science there might be some hypothesis in science or some theories that might conflict with some understanding so for example there might be people who have some interpretation of the Quran that would not match with some theories in science but nothing concrete from science would conflict those explicit texts of the Quran which are nas as I said, if there is any conflict, it's either the one side is mistaken or the both sides are mistaken. If you remember, we had a discussion about evolution. And I told you there are still discussions among the scientists about evolution. But even if evolution is accepted, we don't have any problem with evolution. The Quran can be understood in the way that confirms evolution. And also evolution by itself can be a sign of design of God God has created this world he could have designed it in the way that things from the beginning are fixed or we can say he has created the world in a way that things evolve I quoted for you the opinion of Ayatollah Mutahari that actually if the world is created in the way that it evolves it shows more intelligence and more you know complexity on the side of the designer there are many issues that the scientists have mentioned and actually they show that the Quran has preceded human conventional knowledge of science for example about the way human embryo develops there's a discussion here and there are lots of also uh, materials on internet uh, about the way scientists very recently if you had asked scientists of the 19th century 18th centuries early 20th centuries still they didn't understand many things about what the Quran says about development of embryo but after development of science now they have realized that the Quran has mentioned many things about embryo that were not known to the scientists there is something for your study here in the book about professor Moore and how some Muslim scholars presented him the Quranic report about development of embryo and then he answered and then he published uh, many things based on that and he was saying that uh, for me it's obvious that Quran must be a word of God because no human being knew this even he says we didn't know this up to recently then we have some sayings of the Quran and Hadith about intellect and this is the end of our discussion today inshallah we will continue with the characteristics of the prophets in the next session in many verses of the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us to use our intellect to think to rationalize to ponder to argue for example in 
the Quran, we have a very remarkable statement by the people who are put in hell. When they explain why they have ended up with being in hell, they say, Qalu, law kunna nasma'u aw na'gil, ma kunna fi ashab al -sair. Had we been thinking or listening, we are not here. It means that we didn't use our intellect and we didn't listen to the prophets. So neither we use our own aql nor we benefited from revelation and therefore we were misguided and we harmed ourselves and other people. So it means that even the criminals, if they had followed their own intellect, if they were rational, they would have not been in the situation that they are right now. Because intellect in every human being functions in the same way and it's a hujja of Allah. You need just to use it and do it properly. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has many things about intellect. For example, he said, استرشد العقل ترشد or ترشد Ask intellect to help you, to guide you, and then you will be guided. And do not disobey intellect, otherwise you would regret. Anyone who doesn't use his aql or her aql, then he would regret or she would regret. Um, Amir al muminir said, al rasul al haq Aql is like a messenger, an apostle of God, of the truth. So we stop here and inshallah we will carry on the discussion in the next session. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alamin.